Hello friends, welcome to daily newspaper analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 29-6-2024. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are about to be discussed today. So without much delay, let's get started. Before getting into today's newspaper discussion, let us see answer key for the yesterday's prelims practice questions. Look at this question. Consider the following pass of glaciers with reverse. Bandarpunch, Yamuna, Bara Shingri, Chanab, Mailam, Mandagini, Siachin, Nubra, Zemu, Manas. Which of the paths given above are correctly matched? And the correct answer for this question is option A, 1, 2, 1, 4. And the second question is, with reference to Indus river system, of the following four rivers, three of them pour into one, which joins the Indus directly? Among the following, which one of the river is a river that joins Indus directly? Option A, Chenab, Option B, Jilam, Option C, Ravi, Option D, Sutlaj. And the correct answer is Sutlaj. With this, let's get into our newspaper discussion for the day. Look at this article. It is written by Sonia Gandhi, MP of Congress Party in Rajya Sabha. The start of 18th Lok Sabha has been discouraging with no sign of new spirit of mutual respect. Opposition parties asked for the Deputy Speaker's position but were denied by the government. Modi government brought up the discussion of emergency period to divert the attention from current issues. Previously, 146 MPs were suspended to pass new criminal justice laws without discussion. Forest conservation laws were pushed through without a proper debate. The recent Great Nicobar project could lead to ecological disaster. The NEET scandal has affected many students but the education minister denied its impact. BJP rule states are demolishing homes of minorities without the due process of law. Manipur has experienced severe violence with hundreds of killers and thousands displaced. Prime Minister has not visited the state or addressed its leaders, leading to dissatisfaction among the people. But the speaker is talking about the past emergency period in the parliament. These are some of the arguments mentioned in the editorial by the author. In this context, let us discuss a mains practice question. Look at this question. How far do you think cooperation, competition and confrontation have shaped the nature of the federalism in India? Cite some of the recent example to validate your answer. See, this topic comes under GS paper 2 of UPSC mains. Here we have to discuss the following terms in accordance with the federalism in India with recent example. Discuss on how cooperation, competition and confrontation have shaped Indian federalism. Conclude with suggestive measures to reduce the confrontation among the federal units. This is how we are going to approach this question. So let us start with an introduction. A federal government is one in which the powers are divided between national government and the regional government by the constitution itself. Indian federalism has a strong unitary bias but due to its unique socio, economic and political condition, it has evolved to assume the various features of cooperation, competitive and confrontational federalism. Now we shall see the body part of the answer. Cooperative federalism comprises of federal government and the state government cooperating together during the national's overall development. The center and the states do have horizontal engagement in cooperative federalism, where they cooperate in larger public interest. Cooperative federalism is a top-down approach, whereby the government is providing the policy framework and inputs, but still the states are responsible for its execution. The Indian constitution has cooperative federalism as a part of its basic structure. Examples are GST, Land Reforms, Model APMC Act and 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992. Then let's see about the competitive federalism. See it envisages competition between the states. When India opened its doors for globalization, there was a greater competition for limited resources among the states. As a result, the states are now in the state of imbalance and inequality. Competitive federalism has recently proven to be an effective technique for boosting individual states' economic development. The union and the states are not required by the constitution to work together on the issues listed in the schedule 7 of the constitution. Executives make the decision. The Indian constitution does not include competitive federalism in its basic structure. Examples Vibrant Gujarat, Resurgent Rajasthan and various indices evolved by Niti Aayog. The SDG Index India, Aspirational District Programs, Swachh Bharat Ranking, Ease of Doing Business Ranking incorporates a sense of competition among the states for funds from the central government. Lastly, about the confrontational federalism. It is a result of central government transgressing into the powers of the state government. The unilateral revocation of the special status conferred on Jammu and Kashmir under the Article 370 of the Constitution has been criticized by many experts as against 
the spirit of federalism. Many constitutional experts have criticized the central government's decision of using a concurrent list to make laws on the state list subjects. For example, the role of governor as an agent of central government in Maharashtra and Karnataka, whereby governors act in a partition way, generally against the state governments whose views are not in coherence with the party in power at the union level. Now let us give some points as a way forward. Cooperative and competitive federalism is India's future. Competitive federalism generates the dynamism that is needed. To balance competitive federalism, we need cooperative federalism. To foster India's internal unity, the constitution needed to catch up with the economists and favor integration before preserving sovereignty. According to the Article 263, this council is responsible for the investigation and advising on disputes, discussing topics that affect all the states and making proposals for the improved policy coordination. On issues like international treaties, WTO obligations or environment, an institutional mechanism must be evolved where important decisions are appropriately discussed with the states. Finally, let's move on to discuss our conclusion. In S.R. Bomai v. Union of India 1994 case, the Supreme Court held federalism as a part of basic structure of constitution. However, due to the strong unitary bias and particularly the way it has evolved over the years, many constitutional experts describe India's federalism as federation without federalism or a union of unequal states or a quasi-federal in nature. So that's all about this answer. With this, let's move on to our next article for our discussion. Look at this article. It talks about recent US report on India's religious freedom. Let us break down this article and understand this issue clearly. First, let us see the background. See US Secretary of the State, Antony Blinken, released a report called on International Religious Freedom 2023. This report criticized several countries, including India, for not protecting religious rights and minority rights. Blinken pointed out increased anti-conversion laws, hate speech and demolition of homes and places of worship in India. The report included 69 pages on India highlighting the issues like Uniform Civil Code and the push for Hindu Rashtra. Now let us see what is the response of India in this regard. India has rightly criticized the US report on international religious freedom and calling it deeply biased and one-sided. External Affairs Minister's spokesperson Randir Jaiswal said that the report unfairly questioned India's legal judgments and highlighted US domestic issues with hate crimes. Moving on, let us see the concerns raised by India. The report was described as a mix of misrepresentation selective facts and biased sources. Jaiswal accused the report of selectively picking incidents to create preconceived narratives against India. He also mentioned that the report misrepresented India's constitutional provisions and laws. So this is all about this news article. Now we shall understand about the differences between Indian model of secularism and the western secularism. See the Indian secularism emphasizes equal respect for all the religions and maintain a policy of religious neutrality by the state. Whereas the western secularism on the other hand often involves a stricter separation of religion and government. Indian secularism promotes religious pluralism and respects all religions without favoritism. American secularism is based on the first amendment which prohibits the establishment of state religion and protects religious freedom. For your easy understanding, have a look at this table. You can pause the video and go through it. That's all about this article. With this, let's move on to our next topic for our discussion. Look at this article. The Karnataka Tourist Department plans to promote UNESCO heritage sites of Somnathpur as a part of Mysore tourist circuit. They aim to raise awareness of the 13th century Keshava temple by cross-promoting it as a popular tourist spot in Mysuru. They are also discussing to operate buses, ferries, to the tourist to Somnathpur and explore conducting cultural programs there during Dasara. This is the crux of this article. In this backdrop, let us study in detail about UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Firstly, what are these World Heritage Areas? See, these are all the areas which have cultural, historical, scientific or other forms of significance. They are selected and protected under the convention which is administered by UNESCO. Note that India is a home to 42 UNESCO World Heritage Sites which showcase the country's rich heritage and natural beauty. These include 34 cultural sites, 7 natural sites and 2 mixed sites. These sites spread across India highlight the country's diverse culture and stunning landscapes. 
Preserving these sites is essential to protect India's heritage for the future generations. Now let us see how can a site become a World Heritage Site or we can ask what is the selection process. See, to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a place must go through a nomination and evaluation process. Two main organization that is the International Council on Monuments and Sites and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature review each nominated sites. A site must show outstanding universal value by meeting one or more specific criteria outlined in the UNESCO Convention. Now let's see what happens after the designation of a site as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. See once the site is designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it still belongs to the country it is in. But protecting and preserving its value became a shared duty of all humanity. Still the country should do the following. The country must identify, protect, conserve and pause on the site's cultural and natural heritage to the future generation. The country should include heritage protection in their planning program. Regularly report to the World Heritage Committee on the site's condition and avoid action that could harm the site. The country should promote appreciation and respect for the site through education and information programs. The World Heritage Committee can send experts to help protect the site from threats. Note that in severe cases, the site can be removed from the list or face sanctions. Now have a look at this table. As we have discussed, India has 34 cultural sites, 7 natural sites and 2 mixed sites. Also note that two Indian sites were added in the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2023. They are sacred ensembles of Hausalyas and Shantiniketan. These sites were in 2024 UPSC prelims. So have a glance at this table carefully. That's all about this discussion. With this, let's move to our next article. Look at this article. Former Jharkhand Chief Minister Hemant Soren was granted by Jharkhand High Court in the money laundering case. The court found no strong evidence against him. After spending five months in jail, Soren was released and went to his father's house, welcomed by his supporters. He expressed concerns over the suppression of voices like politician and journalist. This is the crux of this article. Now let us learn in detail about the bail from our exam perspective. Now what is bail? See bail is a temporary release of an accused person in a criminal case, while the court has not yet made a final judgment. The word bail comes from the old French verb bailer, which means to give or to deliver. The bail also involves depositing security to ensure the accused will return for the court appearances. Now let us see what are the types of bails in India. See there are three main types of bail. First one is the regular bail. It is granted to the person who has been arrested or in the police custody. This can be applied under the section of 437 and 439 of the Code of Criminal Procedure that is CRPC. The second one is interim bail. It is a short term bail given before a regular or anticipatory bail hearing. The third one is anticipatory bail. It is granted under the section 438 of CRPC to someone who anticipates being arrested for a non-bailable offences. It can be requested from a session court or a high court. Now, Coming to another question, do all the offences are bailable? The answer is no. Not all the offences are bailable. They are bailable only if they have sufficient reasons to believe that the accused did not commit the offence and there is a need for further investigation. Also, the accused is not charged with the offence punishable by death, life imprisonment or imprisonment up to 10 years. With this note, there are some exceptions to bail. That is, it is very hard to get bail for some laws like NDPS Act, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that is UAPA and the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. But in some offences are non-bailable in nature. If the accused is a woman or a child, if there is a lack of evidence or delay in filing FIR, also if an accused is seriously ill. Now, let us see, can the judiciary cancel the bail once again? The answer is undoubtedly yes. The court can cancel bail at any time and order the police to arrest the person and keep them in the custody. So that's all about this article. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Look at this article. Northern states in India, including Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh and Chandigarh are expecting heavy rain until July 2. Shimla, the capital of Himachal Pradesh, experienced heavy rain on Friday. The Indian Meteorological Department predicts that rain will intensify with light to moderate rain expected in the lower and the mid-hill district of Himachal Pradesh from June 28 to July 1. Very heavy rainfall is also expected in isolated areas of Haryana and Punjab during this period. Chandigarh is likely to see heavy rain from June 2 to July 2. 
This is the crux of this article given in Hindu newspaper. With this backdrop about the prospective rainfall in the northern states of India, we shall see about some important climate issues faced by the northeastern states in India, particularly the floods in Assam. See, there are multiple reasons for it. Let's see them one by one. One of the main reason is the presence of Brahmaputra River, which originates from Himalayas and flows through Assam. This river carries a lot of sediments from the mountainous and deposit in Assam's plain rising the riverbed and causing frequent overflows. Additionally, Assam experiences heavy monsoon rains, especially in June and July, which further contribute to the flooding. The region also receives significant rainfall in April and May, saturating the soil before the heavy monsoon rain begin. Riverbed erosion is also one of the other major issue. As rivers move through Assam, they erode their banks, expanding the river and causing more flooding. This erosion has caused many villages to disappear, displacing people and increasing the river width in some areas up to 15 km. Human activities have also worsened the flooding. The construction of embankments, which began in 1960s to control flood, has led to additional challenges. Many of these embankments are now in poor condition or have been washed away, and the river often breaches these barriers during floods. Furthermore, encroachments on the riverbanks and the unplanned urban development have obstructed the natural drainage system, making flooding even more worse. Assam's growing population has put more pressure on the state's ecology, with the population density in the Brahmaputra Valley increasing significantly over the decades. Other human activities such as deforestation, hill cutting and the destruction of wetlands have also contributed to the problem. Climate change is exacerbating the situation by causing more extreme rainfall event and increasing temperatures, which led to more glacier melting. This results in higher water and sediment level in the rivers, increasing the livelihood of flash floods. Floods have severe impact on Assam's infrastructure and wildlife. Kaziranga National Park, home to many animals, get inundated, leading to animal death and human-animal conflict as animals move towards village in search of higher ground. Flooding also disrupts train services, damages road and bridges and affects the electricity supply. Food and portable water become scarce and many people are displaced from their homes. So in conclusion, we can say that the impacts are severe, affecting both humans and wildlife and require a comprehensive measures to manage and mitigate the flood risk. That's all about this article. With this, let's move to our next topic for our discussion. Look at this article. The recent events in Kenya leads to the precarious situation of balancing the international financial obligation and addressing the needs of its citizen. Recently, Kenya planned to pass an IMF-backed finance bill, which proposes a significant tax increases on essential goods. This ignited widespread protest that resulted in tragic casualties and forced the government to retract the bill. See, the Kenya's financial situation was becoming worse. Forced to it, heavily reliant on borrowing from international bodies like IMF and World Bank, as well as bilateral loans from countries such as China. This debt exacerbated by the global crisis like COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine war and has severely strained the country's economy. Moreover, rising global interest rates have further increased the debt repayment burden for many African countries, leading to defaults like nations like Zambia and Ghana. The new president of Kenya, President Ruto, has faced criticism for adhering to traditional and unpopular measures dictated by IMF. This includes measures like increased taxation and austerity without considering the immediate economic hardship faced by the significant portion of the population. The protest and the subsequent withdrawal of the finance bill highlight the need for a more nuanced approach that balances debt repayment with social welfare. Going forward, it is crucial for Kenya to explore innovative and sustainable economic strategies that do not disproportionately affect the poor. This includes negotiating more favorable terms with the creditors and seeking comprehensive debt restructuring solutions. Additionally, international lenders should consider the broader implication of their financial demands and work collaboratively with the debtor nation to ensure that the debt repayment plan do not exacerbate poverty and social unrest. This is the crux of this article. In our discussion, let us see about the various lending instruments of IMF from our exam perspective. The first one is Standby Agreement, that is SBA. The Standby Agreements provides short-term financial assistance to the countries which are facing balance of payment problems. Historically, 
it has been the IMF lending instrument most used by the advanced and the emerging market countries. When a country receives fund via standby arrangements, then the country must take measures to address the problems that led the country to seek funding in the first place. The SBA is provided in tranches and before each tranche is provided, the IMF reviews the country's policy. The current bailout package for Pakistan is provided under the SBA facility only. The second one is the standby credit facility that is SCF. The standby credit facility provides financial assistance to the low income countries with the short term balance of payment needs. The SCF is one of the facilities under the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. Here note that both SBA and SCF are provided to avoid present prospective or the potential balance of payment crisis. When a balance of payment crisis extends for a protracted period, then IMF provides support through the extended fund facility and the extended credit facility. Both these facilities provide financial assistance to the countries facing serious medium term balance of payment problem because of structural weakness that require time to address. To help countries implement medium term structural reforms, these facilities offer longer program engagement and longer repayment period. The advanced and the emerging economies are offered EFF that is extended fund facility and the low income countries are offered extended credit facility. In 2019, Pakistan used extended fund facility to get financial support from IMF. For the urgent balance of payment needs, the IMF has rapid financing instruments and the rapid credit facility. Both are designed to provide financing to the countries that are experiencing a sudden and unexpected balance of payment needs. Here, RFI that is rapid financing instrument is mainly used by the advanced and the emerging countries and the RCF that is rapid credit facility is used by the low income countries. The next one is short term liquidity line that is SLL. The SLL provided for IMF members with very strong policy framework and fundamental who face potential moderate short term liquidity needs. These countries with a strong policy framework fall into balance of payment shock due to external shocks. The SLL aims to minimize the risk of shocks developing into deeper crisis and spreading to other countries. Finally, there is a resilience and sustainability facility that is RSF. The resilience and sustainability facility provides affordable long-term financing to the countries undertaking reforms to reduce risk of prospective balance of payment stability, including those related to climate change and pandemic preparedness. Now let us see about IMF Special Drawing Rights The Special Drawing Rights, that is SDR, is an international reserve asset created by IMF to supplement the official reserves of its member states. It represents a basket of currencies which includes US Dollar, Euro, Chinese Yuan, Japanese Yen and British Pound. Know that it is neither a currency nor a claim on IMF, rather it is a potential claim on the freely usable currencies of the IMF members. Moreover, the currency value of SDR is determined by summing the values of US dollar based on market exchange rates of a SDR basket of currencies. The SDR currency value is calculated daily except on IMF holidays or whenever the IMF is closed for business and the valuation basket is reviewed and adjusted every five years. Let's see the weights of each currency in the IMF basket before we come to our end of our discussion. See. The USD accounts for 43% Euro accounts for 29% Chinese Rumini has 12% Japanese Yen has 7.59% and the British Pound has 7.44% So that's all regarding this discussion. Now having discussed with the news discussion for the day, let's move on to our next section that is prelims practice questions. Look at our first question. With reference to disaster management in India, consider the following statements. The National Disaster Management Authority is chaired by Prime Minister of India. The Disaster Management Act 2005 provides for the establishment of the State Disaster Management Authority in every state chaired by the Chief Minister. The National Disaster Response Force is the primary agency responsible for disaster response and is under the administrative control of the Ministry of Home Affairs. Which of the statements given above are correct? 1 and 2 only, 1 and 3 only, 2 and 3 only, 1, 2, 1, 3. And the correct answer is option D1213. Look at our next question. Which amendment of Indian constitution added the word integrity to the preamble reinforcing the concept of federalism? Option A, 24th amendment. Option B, 
ఫార్టీ సెకండ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ఆప్షన్ సి ఫిఫ్టీ సెకండ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ఆప్షన్ డి సిక్స్టీ సెకండ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ద కరెక్ట్ ఆన్సర్ ఇస్ ఆప్షన్ బి ఫార్టీ సెకండ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ద ఫార్టీ సెకండ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ఇన్ నైన్టీన్ సెవెంటీ సిక్స్ డ్యూరింగ్ ద ఎమర్జెన్సీ పీరియడ్ ఇస్ వన్ ఆఫ్ ద మోస్ట్ కాంప్రిహెన్సివ్ అమెండ్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ ది ఇండియన్ కాన్స్టిట్యూషన్ ఇట్ ఆడెడ్ ద వర్డ్ సోషలిస్ట్ సెక్యులర్ అండ్ ఇంటగ్రిటీ టు ద ప్రియాంబల్ Federalism in India involves the division of powers between union and state government. The addition of integrity to the preamble underscores the importance of preserving national unity despite the federal division of powers. Let's move on to our next question now. Which of the following is a characteristics of western secularism? Option A, the state can make laws to regulate religious institution. Option B, the state provides financial support to religious schools. Option C, religion is considered a completely private matter option d the state recognizes multiple official religions the correct answer is option c religion is considered a completely private matter look at this question with reference to the provisions of bail in india consider the following statement statement 1 regular bail can be granted to a person who has been arrested or in the police custody under the section 437 and 439 of the code of criminal procedure statement 2 interim bail is a long term bail granted after a regular or anticipatory bail hearing statement 3 anticipatory bail can be granted under the section of 438 of crpc to a person who anticipates being arrested for a non bailable offenses statement 4 bail is generally difficult to obtain under the laws such as ndps act unlawful activities prevention act and the prevention of money laundering act which of the statements given above are correct option a 1 and 2 only option b 1 3 and 4 only option c 214 only option d 1 2 3 and 4 interested aspirants please answer the correct option in the comment section and we shall discuss the answer key in the tomorrow's discussion let's see the next question consider the following statements statement 1 the motor flens ford reforms of 1919 recommended granting voting rights to all women above age of 21 statement 2 the government of india act of 1935 gave women reserved seats in the legislature which of the following statements are correct one only two only both one and two neither one not two please do answer for this question in the comment section and we shall look at the answer key tomorrow for this question also that's all for today's discussion displayed here is the today's mains practice question interested candidates can write it in the comment section below if you like this video please hit like share and subscribe thank you